Well, I don't want to try to say that I'm too much like Jesus, but I did come back. I hear it was even dark while I was gone, so I think next time I go on vacation or on a trip somewhere, I'm going to announce it by dragging a power generator out and just putting it in front, like we're at the communion table, and just, well, at least we can make coffee while I'm gone, if the power goes out again. seems to happen somewhat regularly. But thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, Dashal and I had a really great time away on retreat um, from April 9 to 16th. We were at Focus on the Families, uh, Carith Creek Retreat Center for Pastors and Ministry Leaders. It was a really remarkable and restorative experience just on, on so many different levels. The facility and the property, the retreat director couple and the host couple, the food, time spent in sessions and alone with the Lord, even the weather. I'm not really sure what happened since, but we did bring it back with us there for a bit. And did I mention the food? Like The food really was a highlight. Uh, one of the other uh, attendees, every meal, she'd take a photo of the food to send back to her teenage son who was into cooking. Uh, it wasn't just tasty, it was just so beautifully presented. Uh, we were really treated well. And I think it's safe to say that we left some burdens there. We found some practices and opportunities for uh, better perspective and ministry health going forward, and we'll continue to, to process some things into the weeks ahead. I mentioned the food at our retreat because we were really well taken care of, but I also mention it because I think that food and eating together and meals has a lot of value beyond just simple basic taking calories in to nourish your body. Gathering around food, whether it's, whether it's fancy or whether it's just simply very simple, often has profound spiritual value. I think I noted on Easter Sunday how frequently Jesus always seems to be eating meals with people, or he's going to a meal, or he's coming from one, but it seems to be a pretty frequent thing. And this was certainly also the case with the resurrection appearances to the disciples. It always seemed that Jesus met them as they were gathering to enjoy food together. And we see this in our passage that we're going to look at today. So I would invite you to stand. Uh, out of respect for the reading of God's word that we're going to learn from here, uh, John chapter 21. I'll just give you a moment to turn there. John 21. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. There were 153 large fish, yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, he asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you, Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. 
But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that this disciple wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This disciple is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. So it's a pretty well-known uh, passage from the story of the resurrection of Jesus and his appearances to his apostles after that. One of the first things that I think we need to notice about this passage is that Jesus' call is not just for those who are perfect, or certainly no one is perfect, but for those who seem to be perfect or have it all together. And I think we need to understand this on a couple of levels. Uh, the moral level and the, the practical level. Because in Peter, we have someone who's kind of missed it on both counts. First, we have what we might call the, the moral failure of Peter, don't we? Just flip back, you can if you want, to John 18, uh, starting at verse 5. Jesus' trial before the Jewish authorities. You know this well, I'm sure. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. They, that other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it warming themselves, and Peter stood with them warming himself. And then just a few verses down. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire warming himself, they asked him again, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, Didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. So in that passage, we see that, that Simon Peter makes a, a threefold, three times denial that he ever even knew Jesus at all. And, and in our passage for today, we see that Peter is threefold restored from that moral failure, from that denial of his faith. And, and the Apostle John also makes that connection, right? It was standing around a charcoal fire in the high priest's courtyard where Peter made that denial three times. And then in this passage for today from John 21, he makes a specific mention that it was standing around a charcoal fire on the beach being welcomed by Jesus that he receives the opportunity and the affirmation three times to return to his faith. It's drawing attention to the fact that Peter has failed at a moral or just a, a basic faith level, right? He's denied his faith. But Jesus is able and willing to restore him despite having denied him. So that's the, the moral level or the faith level. But I think Peter has kind of failed at another level too. What we might just call a, a practical level or maybe a calling level. Just to set the stage a bit here. There are important ways, I think, in which we need to understand each of the four Gospels on their own terms. That's why we have four different Gospels. They all present a unique picture of who Jesus was and his life work and his ministry. However, John, which most scholars believe was written last and possibly sometime after the first three Gospels, he frequently assumes that you already know what's come in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And today is a prime example of that. So from Luke chapter 5, and just keep in mind what we've just read from John 21 and the miraculous catch of fish. Let's look at Luke chapter 5 just briefly. One day, this is from early in Jesus' ministry. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. 
He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push off out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. So Simon Peter's initial call to follow Jesus came in the context of a miraculous catch of fish, which led him to abandon fishing as an occupation, fishing for fish, to follow Jesus in his ministry and become his disciple, which Jesus likened to fishing for people. But by the time the events of John 21 take place, right, we've had the ministry, we've had the betrayal, we've had the crucifixion, and we have had the resurrection of Jesus. Simon Peter has encountered the risen Lord, it says on two occasions at least, and there may have been some in the other Gospels that John doesn't report. So he's seen the crucifixion and all the, the disappointment that came with that. And he has also seen the resurrection, but he still seems confused, doesn't he? He still seems maybe even paralyzed in terms of his calling. He doesn't know what to do. Now, to be fair, Jesus in his resurrection appearances kind of comes and goes. And when he does tell the disciples to do something, he kind of just tells them, well, wait, hold on, things are going to happen. But... Simon just seems kind of lost. He seems kind of paralyzed. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do, and so he mostly just goes back to what he knows, which, which is fishing. And I think we can understand this in some ways even apart from his denial of Jesus. Certainly there's, there's shame in that. There's a sense of being lost in that. But everything he thought he knew had just come crashing down in the betrayal and crucifixion of Jesus. He'd witnessed terrible things, traumatic things, and while he and the other disciples have seen the risen Lord and interacted with him, like I said, he hasn't given them really specific instructions about, okay, here's what you need to do next, guys. Here's your marching orders. That's still to come. And so Peter just went back to what he knew best, fishing. Even if that meant stepping out of his calling, right, to fish for people, he just went back to fishing for fish. And maybe you know this. Even apart from having committed some serious sin or from having lost your faith or abandoned it or denied the Lord, but maybe just the circumstances of life, the, the difficulties you faced, uh, the loss of key support relationships that have been important to you, or, or health challenges, any or all of these things and other things too can contribute to this sense of a feeling stuck or paralyzed, right? Maybe it's in your call to, to be a good parent or a good spouse or to be a person of salt and light in your workplace or to serve the Lord through your studies or to even be faithful in your ministry calling. At some point in our lives, we'll all feel that sense of being stuck or even paralyzed and wondering like, Lord, what, what is it you want me to do? I do it, but I don't know. I don't understand. I feel lost. I don't get it. I'm stuck. And I think I know this. You know this. It's not ideal, obviously, to get to this place, but it will happen pretty much to all of us at some point. And in that season of feeling stuck, we can just, we can withdraw from what we know in our heads that we should be doing or that Jesus has called us to do because we, like I said, we can't feel his presence with us or we just can't understand what he wants us to do or maybe some combination of both. Now the question surrounding whether that's related to or whether it's caused by 
some moral failure or sin or not, or to what degree those two things might be working together, that has more to do with wise and compassionate spiritual counsel and spiritual direction probably than it does that we're going to solve for each person individually on a Sunday morning. What I do just want to say in preaching this passage is that we must look to the compassion of Jesus as we seek to understand and deal with our own issues and as we seek to walk with other brothers and sisters who might be feeling stuck or lost. But what is the same in every situation is the welcome and the compassion and the restoration of Jesus that is waiting there for us if we turn back to him. So the specific call that the Lord places on Peter's life. Originally, he had called him to, to fish for people instead of fishing for fish. Here, he, he, same idea, same thing, but just using a different image. And he does it by asking Peter, as I said, three times, uh, do you love me? To restore him from the three times that Peter denied him. And I just want to make one point for any of the language nerds among us about Jesus' repeated questions, because maybe some of you have heard this before. Uh, Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? Uh, Jesus uses two different Greek words there. The first two times, he uses the word agapao. That's kind of the, the Christian love, the theological love. And the third time, he uses the word phileo for love, the word for brotherly love, or the word for friendship. Some scholars have suggested that Simon Peter was grieved the third time that Jesus asked him the question because Jesus switched the terms and was maybe kind of lowering the bar. Like, you know, do you, do you love me in this big theological sense? Well, do you even love me like a brother or like a friend? That he somehow wasn't really accepting Peter's first two confessions and kind of lowered the bar somehow. More recent, I would say better scholarship, has pointed out that uh, these two Greek words for love, they're used pretty much interchangeably in the Gospel of John. Uh, and in fact, John uses them uh, for God's love for lost humanity. And he uses them for the Father's love for his Son. And honestly, in the Gospel of John, I don't think friendship as a form of love is like some kind of second-rate form of love at all. From John 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you everything you ask for using my name. This is my commandment. Love each other. If there is a distinction at all between Jesus' last question, do you love me as a friend or do you love me as a brother, he might actually, I think, be raising the bar. Not just communicating forgiveness in an abstract theological sense to Peter, but asking him a question and giving him an affirmation that, that communicates restoration in a relational sense. Right? The restoration from both his moral failure and the renewal of his purpose from his practical failure. What I mean to say here is that Jesus doesn't just forgive Peter in like a legal or a technical sense. He invites him back in to participate in the mission his father gave him and that he's invited the apostles into. Right? I don't call you servants or slaves anymore. I call you my friends, my brothers, because I'm entrusting you with what the father has entrusted me. And what is this going to practically look like? Well, to draw from another scripture, and I won't read the whole thing. Uh, Lily read it earlier, but from John 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too. They are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The Father loves me because I sacrifice my life so that I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also the authority to take it up again. 
for this is what my Father has commanded. Of course, Jesus is speaking in images, but these are powerful images, right? And the the Bible so frequently calls us sheep because of our neediness and because of our tendency just to wander off. But we have a good shepherd who is full of compassion and wants nothing but the best for us. Jesus has laid down his life in sacrifice and he's taken it up again in the resurrection for the sake of the sheep. And what I think we should see when we go back to John chapter 21 is that Jesus, by giving Peter this call to feed the sheep, to take care of the sheep, to tend the flock, he's transforming Peter. To use the language of John chapter 10, he's transforming Peter from a hired hand who is afraid and runs away from the danger and abandons the flock into a shepherd who works under the good shepherd, right? A small s shepherd, under the capital S, good shepherd. Because we see in this chapter that Peter's call becomes the same as what Jesus said his mission was, to be a shepherd of the sheep who is then even willing to go so far for them as to lay down his own life for their sake. Last point here, and this this is coming back to where I started. Did you notice that before Jesus called Peter to feed the sheep, I hesitate to say spiritually, but perhaps pastorally would work, he has already fed the apostles literally. Did you notice that while Jesus provided the apostles with this miraculous catch of fish, 153, and scholars have argued for 20 centuries why it's 153, and we don't have a conclusion. But the point is, there's a lot. A lot of fish. He provided this for them, but he actually had no need of it. What did the apostles find when they, when they struggled ashore, wading through the water, was that Jesus was already there, he had the fire going, there were fish cooking on it, and he was warming the bread up. He already had sufficient means to provide to them. Jesus fed them before he called them to feed others. And again, I'm really hesitant to label Jesus giving them fish as as, as physical or literal or practical and, and then say the call to feed the sheep is spiritual or metaphorical or symbolic or, or even pastoral. Feeding people actual food can have implications far beyond just the physical. And caring for souls often involves far more than just what we would call spiritual. And just to provide an example from our last week, uh, the retreat we attended was with three other couples in ministry. So there's eight guest couples. There's a facilitator couple who lead the retreat sessions. Their names were Marshall and Mary, And Mary spells her name M-E-R-R-I-E. So perhaps she's part hobbit? She was pretty short. Just saying. Uh, And then there was a host couple. And they do the cooking and they help with the general hospitality of running the retreat. And their names were Ben and Eva. And they were such a huge blessing. Like there's a way that you could do that role that would just kind of fulfill it, basically. You make the meals that are specified on the menu, put them on the table. But they just took it to a whole other level. It was clear that these two people, who weren't getting paid for this, who were doing this as a volunteer role, who had, I think, driven like nine or ten hours to spend this week at this retreat, they were just operating in the sweet spot of the way that the Lord had gifted them. And it went further than just going above and beyond in terms of tweaking the recipes to make them better or substituting scratch-made stuff for store-bought or even in the presentation. As I said, one of the guests took pictures of every meal to send to her teenage son. But the way they approached this turned what could have just been ordinary meals of 10 or 12 people around a big dining table into sacred encounters. Because when the way that they fulfilled this role meant that there was another person that we couldn't see seated at the table with us, and that was Jesus. 
right? Those encounters were much like what we read about in John 21, where we were fed so as to be filled to feed others. So in closing, who are the sheep that Jesus has called you to feed? That, that's not a trick question. I don't even think it needs to be a hard question. The Lord has individually placed people in our lives that he's called us to serve. Our family, of course, friends, co-workers, the kids we coach or we teach at Awana. And I just wanted to mention what this means for CIC as a church. Especially given today we had a child dedication. And granted, this one's a bit different in that there's also a farewell element involved. But regardless, we've all heard the statistics. Um, if you were at graduation yesterday, our guest speaker was uh, highly involved in some of the reports uh, that were done for the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, uh, hemorrhaging faith and renegotiating faith, which have detailed the concerning number of young people leaving the church and faith in Jesus. So if we're going to be a church that feeds the sheep, we need to make sure that our youngest members have a priority in that and that we make sure that moms and dads with, with kids and teens at home are equipped to raise them to follow the Lord given the increasing pressures that our culture places on them not to follow the Lord. And if we're going to be a church that feeds the sheep, we need to make sure we help our college students and young adults find their place in the church, not just attending but having meaningful opportunities to serve. And, and even to lead. And we know many from our, our college students and even our young adults uh, won't be here long term. But here's the thing, and this is what I want us to hear clearly, and this is what I hope we can all rally around in this, in this weird little college town where we all find ourselves. For our kids, for our teens, for our college students, for our young adults, I don't want the church in Karenport to be the last church they attend. Um, and then have them just wander away from their faith after that. So in short, we, we must increasingly be a church that cares for and supports everyone from babies to elderly, but one which is focused on raising up the coming generations. So let's take our place in that. Let's look to Jesus together and let's hear that call to feed his sheep. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word which tells us there's a place for us in your mission. Lord, and we know that the call to Peter was a unique call, and yet it's a call to all of us, whether we have a title, pastor, teacher, professor, whether we can put letters behind or, or in front of our name as, as a degree or as a title. Lord, you call us to meaningful service in your kingdom. You have given us, whoever we are, there are sheep for us to feed. Thank you also, Lord, that there is restoration when we need it. When we utterly fail, uh, or just in those occasions when we get stuck, lost, and we don't know what it is you want us to do next, Lord. Uh, may we always remember that your compassion and your forgiveness is sufficient. And in those occasions, may we turn back to you and find that you are all that we need. Lord Jesus, you are our good shepherd and as we've read in these passages today, you are also the one who sacrificed himself for us. And we praise you and thank you for that. In your precious name we pray.